Notice is hereby given of the regular meeting of the Board of Education of the Town of Westfield in the, count, in the County of Union, New Jersey at 7.30 p.m. on the evening of Monday, October 22, 2012 in the boardroom of the Administration Building, 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey. The purpose of the meeting is to transact the regular business of the board and to transact any other business to come properly before the board. This is to advise the general public and to instruct that it be recorded in the minutes that in compliance with Chapter 231 of the Public Laws of 1975 entitled the Open Public Meetings Act, the Westfield School Board on Friday, October 19, 2012 caused to be posted at the Office of the Board of Education located at 302 Elm Street, Westfield, New Jersey and delivered to the Westfield Leader, the Star Ledger, the Westfield Library, the Town Clerk of Westfield, the Alternative Press, and Patch.com a meeting notice setting forth the time, date, and location of this meeting. Dana, could you take a roll call? Rich Matesic? Here. Ann Carey? Here. Jane Clancy? Here. Mark Friedman? Here. Roseanne Kerstead? Ginny Lights? Here. Gretchen Oleg? Here. Mitchell Slater? Here. Ann, could you lead us in the next one? Supposed to be Jane? Sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, announcements, Gretchen, anything on your end? I do, I have a couple. Um, a few. Um, on October 12th, the Westfield High School volleyball teams and the Breast Cancer Awareness Club teamed up to host a tournament against East Brunswick and a silent auction to support the fight against breast cancer. The 2012 Pink Out raised $18,470 to be donated to the Susan G. Komen for the cure. Kudos to all the students, faculty, families, and area businesses who contributed to the success of this worthwhile cause. The Pink Out has been an annual event initiated by the volleyball team in honor of their coach, Beverly Torok, herself a breast cancer survivor. Uh, in other news, district staff continues to provide leadership and guidance in their prospective fields. Recently, athletic trainer Christopher Flores wrote an article on shoulder exercises for quarterbacks that was published in STAC, a scholastic magazine that is distributed through the United States and focuses on fitness, nutrition, and sports. And I think I'm going to do Roseanne's. Um, thank you to our Breaks volunteers who held another successful annual Walk to School Day event on October 3rd. Each of Westfield's six elementary schools participated, despite the rain. I think it was a few showers. Thank you to our town administrators, councilmen, firefighters, and police officers who walked to school with the winner of the Walk to School Day raffles. The goal of the Breaks group is to improve the health and safety of our children in neighborhoods. And finally, under special education, the Special Education Parent Committee will host a meeting on Wednesday, October 24th at 7.30 p.m. at Edison Intermediate School's library. The guest speaker, Dr. Odesky, is a neuropsychologist who will address the topic, Understanding Learning Disabilities. These announcements are related to athletics. Congratulations to Westfield High School senior Lexi Bohr who won an individual state tennis championship at first singles. The last time that this was accomplished in girls tennis was in 1976. Congratulations to the Westfield High School gymnastics team for winning the Union County Tournament on Friday night. And finally, we are pleased to announce that our boys swimming coach, Jeff Knight, has been selected as New Jersey's Coach of the Year for 2011-2012 for boys swimming and will be receiving the National Federation of High Schools Association Award on Sunday, April 14th, 2013. He's the only boys swimming coach from the entire state to receive this honor. Congratulations to all. And this is from the intermediate schools. Our intermediate schools are rehearsing for their upcoming drama productions. On October 25th through 27th, Edison will be performing Romeo and Juliet Alive and Together at Last. <laughs> and on November 2 through 4, Get Smart will be performed at Roosevelt. More information and tickets are available at each school. Mitch? Oh, at the high school. Uh, Peter Renwick, principal of Westfield High School, has been invited to be a panelist on an education roundtable sponsored by New Jersey Spotlight on Friday, October 26th from 11 a.m. 
to 2 p.m. at the Masonic Temple in Trenton. The panelists, who will be moderated by John Mooney of New Jersey Spotlight, will also include Education Commissioner Christopher Cerf and representatives of business and education. Two Westfield High School seniors, Jennifer Mandelblatt and Ben Schwartz, have been invited as high school representatives and are invited to comment and ask questions. The topic under discussion will be New Jersey's high school diploma under debate. The timely event is a consequence of the transition from the HISPAs, uh, the high school proficiency assessment, a required test for graduation to PARC, which is the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness and College and Careers, which are end of the year course assessments that most states are adopting to align with the Common Core curriculum standards. Jane. Congratulations to Frank <laughs> Franklin fifth grader Sarah Wheatley, who won first place in New Jersey in the Tar Wars poster contest. Sarah advanced to the Nationals, where she placed seventh in the photo contest. She was invited to Washington, D.C., where she toured the Capitol and met with New Jersey state legislators. For the past 11 years, Franklin students have entered the anti-smoking contest and have earned a place each year at the state level, progressing to the national contest six times. Sarah's seventh place in the national contest is the highest honor yet. Sarah's one of my former students, so an extra congratulations to Sarah. And Tamaqua School has again successfully won a school garden grant. The latest grant from the Whole Kids Foundation and Food Corps is in the amount of $2,000 and will support the ongoing effort of the school to involve the entire school in its focus on nutrition. All right. Congratulations. This is at the high school level. Congratulations to the 2011-2012 editors and staff of The High's Eye, the weekly student-produced newspaper at Westfield High School, for winning a gold medal from the Columbia Scholastic Press Association. High's Eye was judged on both the print and web editions. One of the national judges commented, the wonderful diversity in topics covered in both the print and digital editions offers something for every reader. Rosemary Di Battista and Nicole Simone, co-advisors of High's Eye, stated they are very proud of the work that their staff puts into the High's Eye to every week, and this win is well deserved. And second, congratulations to the Westfield High School Marching Blue Devils Band for winning awards for Best Music, Best Visual, and Best Effect in their school category and competition involving 20 marching <coughs> bands held on October 13th in Hillsboro. We wish them continued luck in their next competition at East Brunswick High School on October 27th. Thank you. All right, all Westfield Public Schools will be closed on Thursday and Friday, November 8th and 9th for teacher professional days. On Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of that week, November 5th, 6th, and 7th, kindergarten through fifth grade will follow a four-hour schedule to permit time for parent conferences. The four-hour session schedule for these grades can be found in the back of the district calendar sent to parents in September. The next Board of Education meeting will be held Tuesday, November 13th at 7.30 p.m. at 302 Elm Street. All right, I'd uh, recognize the public at this time for agenda items only. Seeing no one come to the podium, we'll move to the superintendent reports. Okay, uh, and this, uh, tonight we actually have three different superintendent reports. Um, and, but for the first one, I believe that um, Mr. Matesik is going to give the introduction. Sure. So our first report with respect to district roof replacement. For context to the superintendent's report, I just want to briefly review where we are with respect to our conversations regarding a bond issuance in Westfield. On Monday, September 24th, the town of Westfield was presented with a $16.9 million bond referendum to replace approximately 77% of our school roofs and to install a turf field at our high school. Approximately 25% of our citizens eligible to vote participated in the process and the referendum was soundly defeated. At our last board meeting on October 2nd, we discussed some of the reasons why we felt that the bond referendum did not pass. We also discussed the fact that the district's needs have not changed 
simply because the referendum did not pass. During that meeting, we agreed to a couple of things as a board. First, we determined that because our roofing needs were so immediate, we had to turn our full attention as it relates to facilities projects to our roofs. We determined at the time not to pursue our turf field initiative. We also approved the submission to the county of what I'll call a notice of our intention to hold a special election with respect to our roofs at the next possible date set by the county for voting on such matters. That date is December 11, 2012. We said at our last meeting that we would meet as members of our facilities committee and as members of our finance committee to discuss possible alternatives with respect to the roofs and to come back to the full board at this meeting with a recommendation as to what we feel is the best, best path forward for the district. In this regard, we have spent a significant amount of time with our business administrator and our superintendent discussing our views and charting a path forward. We have asked that our business administrator present for us tonight a review of the current status of our roofs, along with the recommendation of the facilities and finance committees as to how we should move forward. We have also asked our superintendent to, prevent, to present for us tonight the fiscal realities the district will face in the event we do not get sufficient bond monies approved to undertake the roof work. After the presentation and discussion, I will read a resolution setting forth the referendum question we are presenting to the full board for consideration and will ask whether there are any further questions or discussion. After the board's discussion, we will welcome questions from the community before voting as a board on whether to move the resolution forward. With that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dana, our business administrator. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. As Mr. Matesic mentioned, we've spent um, the last several weeks reviewing all of our uh, roofing needs, um, facilities committee, the finance committee. Um, we even had several of you go on a few of our roofs um, and actually look at the situation. Um, and the recommendation from both the Facilities and Finance Committee is to request approval for a bond issuance for the full amount needed um, to replace roofs in the district, which is $13.6 million approximately. That will allow us to complete as many roofs as possible next summer. We're hoping that would be two or three, um, with the remaining roofs to be done the following summer, 2014. Um, we have determined the high school is a priority, so we know that um, the high school would certainly be on for next year, um, and we, as I stated, hopefully one or two additional schools. Um, <clears throat> the plan would be to continue to use our maintenance and reserve accounts for other building improvements. Um, going forward, we have plans to replace classroom floors, upgrade heating and ventilation in some schools, and replace windows and lockers. Um, as you know, we did use maintenance reserve in the last year or so to do um, several boiler replacements, some parking lot repairs, um, some bathroom renovations, and some window and door replacements um, in the past year. <clears throat> Why do we need these roofs? Our, the average age of our schools is 73 years old. Um, a number of the roofs are beyond their useful life. Um, they have active leaks that we can, just cannot even repair any longer and um, we can't even de detect exactly where some of the leaks are, are originating from. And so several of our roofs no longer provide weather protection. We are looking to remove and replace approximately 420,000 square feet or 77% of our roofs. And as I mentioned, the total cost is approximately 13,600,000. This breaks down the total um, cost of 13 million six. These, of course, are estimates. Um, if the bond gets approved, the architects will have the go ahead to develop bid specs and construction documents, and we will go out to bid and um, have to award to the lowest responsible bidder. Um, so these costs may come in under. Um, if they come in over, we'll have to make adjustments to the bid specs, but. Um, there's money in the in the estimates for contingencies. At Montclair High School, 
As I stated, this is our West priority. West 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 West. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen sooner or later. We're taking care of them too. Sorry. <laughs> Westfield High School. <laughs> 83, 83 percent of our roof there will be removed and replaced. Um, this is clearly our priority. Um, we, we do have many active leaks in this building. The remaining area of the roof, the other 17%, we would do preventive maintenance on to prolong the life of that roof. Um, there's also masonry restoration work that's in, in this in our estimates um, for the walls that are at the top of the building to replace cr cracking and deteriorating bricks around, along the top and to repair mortar joints. Um, we have a number of skylights, and you'll see this in, in a number of schools, that will either be removed or replaced. And what we mean by that is if they're providing natural daylight, we will replace them. But if they're not serving a purpose for providing daylight, then they'll be removed um, because skylights tend to create issues with leaks. Um, at the high school, there's a certain amount of, a, a decent amount of equipment up there, um, electrical lines, duct work, and gas piping. Um, so there is money in the budget to deal with those things if we need to when we get up there and start removing the roof. And here's some pictures of some of the roofs at high school. At the high school, you can see um, the, 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 on the left that it's very deteriorated and there's standing water on the right. At Roosevelt School, um, we have almost 100% of the roof that needs to be replaced. Um, again, skylights that we need to take care of. And there is a terracotta trim around the perimeter perimeter of the building where water is actively entering, so we will repair and restore that um, as needed. And there are some pictures. Um, some of the pictures, and a lot of these pictures you can see standing water on the roofs. And in a lot of these <coughs> roofs, you can't see it, but if you, if you pulled up along the edges, um, you could actually just start pulling some of the roof right up. At Edison School, approximately 87% of the roof will be removed and replaced. Um, the remaining roof will have preventive maintenance um, to extend the life expectancy, and we have some chimney masonry restoration work to be done at that school. And some pictures. Some are more obvious than others of the work that needs to be done. At Washington School, we have also approximately 87% of the roof to be removed and replaced. Um, we'll be replacing the fascia at Washington, restoring the chimney, replace the story panel <laughs> system and um, I think I have a picture of that in the next to show it's like an alley that runs down the middle of the roof um, and we're also going to be doing repairs and preventative maintenance on the remaining roof there and I believe on the right is a picture of the story panel um, and on the left again standing water the entire roof at Tamaquas will be removed and replaced um, there is also inadequate drainage on, on the roof of Tamaqua, so we'll be replacing the drainage that is there, the piping, and, and adding additional drainage. Um, and there are also skylights that we'll be removing or replacing. At Lincoln School, 100% of the roof will be removed and replaced, and there are some repairs to the parapet wall that, that need to take place. Um, there was an intent is, as you know, um, you, when the renovations were done to replace that roof, um, but there were unforeseen construction costs at the time that prevented us from doing that, so that's why the roof is um, being done now. And you can see a picture of the deteriorating roof there. At Jefferson, approximately 84% of the roof will be removed and replaced. Um, repairs again and maintenance to the remaining roof. Um, masonry restoration work is needed at, at, at Jefferson as well, and the fascia needs to be replaced there as well. And there's some pictures um, on the right. You can see some of the brick and masonry work that needs to be repaired. At okay, Franklin School, much less of this roof will be replaced. It's approximately 34% of this roof. Um, we will do some repairs and preventative maintenance on the remaining roof to extend that life. Um, and there is some additional masonry restoration, um, chimney restoration, and uh, window caulking repairs that need to take place. And you can see some of the, the window on the bottom left, uh, repairs there, and masonry on the right, and the, the roof that's being replaced on the uh, upper left. 
At Wilson School, approximately 28% of the roof is going to be removed and replaced. Um, repairs and maintenance to the remaining areas and the cupola there needs to be restored um, and some painting work done. And then that's a picture again of the deteriorated roof. And McKinley is much small, only a small portion of McKinley will actually be removed and repaired, approximately 10%, and we will do some maintenance and um, repairs to the remaining roof to extend that life. This is just a picture of the school. That area of the roof was actually difficult to take a picture of, so we don't have a picture of that. At Kaler Stadium Fieldhouse, we'll be replacing, removing and replacing 100% of that roof. And um, you can see some pictures there. That on the left is a, somebody stuck a pen in there to show that that's being pulled up. So without the pen there, you can't tell that there's actually a problem with that roof. Um, and that's a lot of the, the roofs as well. You can't really tell by looking at it, but if you go on there and start um, picking up the pieces, you can actually pull them right up. At the board office, 100% of this roof will be replaced. Um, high, skylights in this building are going to be removed and, sh and filled in. Um, the roof drain is going to be uh, replaced and there's going to be report repairs to the parapet wall. And that's a picture of this roof where you can see a lot of standing water and the skylight. The estimated cost impact to an average homeowner. This was calculated assuming that the bond will be paid over 20 years and also assuming that the bond would be issued um, in the first year after it's approved. Now these are assumptions. If, if the bond is approved, the board will have to make decisions about how to finance um, the work. You can, you'll have a choice to do temporary financing um, for the first phase and then temporary financing for the second phase or you, can, you may want to sell all of the bonds right away for $13 million. Um, what you'll have to do is assess with help of bond council what interest rates are at the time for short-term and long-term financing and make a decision as to what is the best course of action um, for financing the project. This is just one scenario that, that we're showing here. So this is assuming 20 years um, and it was calculated using a blended interest rate which averages 2.5%. And it's calculated on the cost to an average homeowner with a house assessed at $182,000 which is the average um, in the town. And uh, obviously, I'm not going to read all this to you, but the first column, the second column new issue is just for these bonds. So for the first year, which is a partial year, um, the cost would be $31. The last bond, the cost was $45, um, and that was the 16.9 bond in the first year. And again, that was a partial year. So then going down if the next year, 2015, your first full year, the new issue would cost an average homeowner $79. Um, that actually gets reduced to only $5 if you figure in our existing debt because our existing debt is starting to get paid off and that's why you'll see decreases and big decreases in certain years because big chunks of that debt will be paid off. Um, so that one column shows just the new issue and then the last column shows the new issue plus existing debt. So you can see the, the <coughs> highest cost there, the highest increase would be $31 in the first partial year. Next steps. If the bond referendum is approved, the district will, as I said, try to complete as many projects as we can next summer. Um, we are under a bit of a time constraint. Um, we will have to go out to, we're hoping that if the bond is approved, we can get out to bid in March um, or April. Uh, the problem that we have with that time frame is it doesn't give us a whole lot of time for bids of these of this size, um, but we are certainly we will certainly push and get the high school done, and we're hoping to get one or two other schools if we can. The remaining schools will be done in the summer of 2014. Um, the good thing about that is we will have a lot of time to get those bids in order, and we'll get them out early. So we should see um, hopefully good prices on those because we'll have those bids out as early as we can. If the bond referendum fails. Funding will have to come from the operating budget. Um, as you know, the operating budget can only increase by 2%. The tax levy can only increase by 2%, which means that the funding for the, the high school roof, because that would be our priority, 
would have to be reallocated from other program and other costs in the operating budget. Um, those reallocations would have to be sustained for probably three years in order to complete the remaining roofs. And we would probably have to use all of our reserve account also for the roofing projects, which would mean the other maintenance projects that I mentioned earlier um, would have to be put on hold. And at this point, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Dolan. Thank you. So as Dana just said, um, if the, uh, the uh, bond referendum is not approved, we would have to reallocate, um, just to take care of the high school roof this coming <coughs> summer, we would have to reallocate approximately $4 million from the budget. So what does that look like? Well, in order to look at that, it was only a few years ago where we actually had to cut $4 million in a very short period of time. So to start off with, I'm just going to quickly give an overview of what we had to do to cut $4 million um, in just a few years ago. So one of the things we were able to do is we were able to reduce energy <coughs> costs through, cons through our conservation program. We were able to reduce printing and mailing costs by using digital forms and notices. And we were able to negotiate savings in items such as insurance and also professional fees. Now those savings are already built into the budget. So that can't be part of any forward $4 million because that's, those savings are already accounted for in our existing budget. Okay, but that did help us the last go around. Some other things we did when we had to cut $4 million, we had postponed facility improvements. We had also postponed the purchase of, of new technology, and, and those of you who were paying attention last year to our uh, efforts at the board table, we spent a great deal of time with a number of parent and community groups trying to get a technology initiative because we knew we had fallen behind because we had postponed technology. We had also instituted a student activity fee. And, and uh, also, during the same time, in order to, we still weren't at that $4 million, we had to cut approximately 30, over 30 positions. And that included teachers and secretaries and paraprofessionals and supervisors and coordinators and custodians, librarians, and counselors. We also cut stipends for over 40 after-school programs, and we also had cut the substitute salary by um, 10%. So that's what we did previously to make it, make it to, as a quick overview, but that's how we were able to cut $4 million. <coughs> so what, we, what would we do if the bond does fail? And just to get to the Westfield High School roof for next summer, um, we'd have to cut the $4 million, and then the next year we would have to also have approximately $4 million available to do the other roofs in, in desperate need of work, and the year after that we would have to do the next level of priority uh, for roofs. Um, and my guess would be it would actually be another year after that, but it would certainly be three years of that. So in order to get that for approximately $4 million, what would we have to do? And as was suggested, we would have to postpone some facility improvements that we have put in our five-year plan that we've said we need to do. We would also have to postpone our ongoing commitment to technology and to STEM. Putting all that together, we would have saved approximately uh, $500,000. So with $3.5 million left to cut, you really don't have many other options. You could find a few thousand dollars here or there, and we will do that. But really, you would have approximately $3.5 million left, and you'd have to cut personnel. With that big of a cut, you absolutely have to look at every program, every level, and um, everything would have to be reviewed, similar to what we had to do a few years ago. And approximately this time, however, because we've already realize the savings and there it's already built into our budget and a few of the items we would now have to eliminate approximately 50 positions so what would that look like what does 50 positions <coughs> look like I mean some of it could be things like fewer athletic programs that would be both the number of teams the different different sports that we have and also the levels of teams um, we now have some eighth grade teams we have ninth grade teams JV and we have varsity would mean fewer fine arts classes and also the programs. Um, fine arts has always been an area that um, the people of Westfield have quite a commitment to, and the district does as well, but we would have to look to see which of those could we start to do without. Our increased class size uh, at the elementary level, and those who remember when we had to cut the $4 million just a few years ago, we absolutely saw an increase in elementary class sizes. Uh, this is one of the few areas we have been able to restore since those cuts. We have been able to restore the elementary class sizes that um, this district has committed to in years where they do have sufficient money. There would be fewer electives at the intermediate level and also increased class size there. 
and um, there would be a higher minimum enrollment for all Westfield High School classes. Um, this we also saw evidence of years, years ago when we had to cut costs and cut $4 million. We had to um, look at those programs where we had maintained a low class size. And um, for example, two of those programs are AP classes and also Project 79. They're not the only two at the high school, but they're the two that have the biggest number of classes. And you have to make sure you have a, um, equity among all programs, and you have to look at the minimum enrollment for those classes. And there would also be an increase in class size in general at Westfield High School, something we also saw um, the last time we had to cut four point, over $4 million. Uh, as we saw last time as well, there would be a decrease in counseling staff. As we saw last time, there would be a decrease in librarians. And as we saw last time, there would be a decrease in um, technology staff. So um, those who, again, who do remember what it was like when we had to cut $4 million. It wasn't as though it was easy. It wasn't as though pe people and programs and students and adults weren't affected. They were. Um, but that would be somewhat like what it would um, look like if we needed to do that, if the bond doesn't pass. All right. Well, thank you for uh, a very straightforward presentation on the roofs and uh, Dr. Dolan, potential budgetary impact if the referendum doesn't pass. I'll be voting in favor of the roof, uh, of the resolution regarding the roof bond refer referendum this evening. And I just wrote a few notes down as to why. Um, I, and I'm speaking both as a member of the facilities committee and as the finance committee. Um, we've taken a lot of time, not just over these past few weeks, but, but over the past few years, looking at our district's needs. Um, and what began, I'll say, as a question um, on how we can save district, the district money through solar a couple years ago, now has nothing to do with solar. And, and that's an interesting turn. Um, this is really all about the information we learned along the way. And uh, as you may recall, back when we were discussing solar, we had the county evaluate our roofs. Um, and generally speaking, they wouldn't touch them. The roofs needed too much work. We had solar developers uh, come in with their roofing experts in two different rounds of bidding. And both times, uh, not one of them could offer us a proposal that would result in the replacement of our roofs, even after we offered them all of the savings that we would achieve through solar. Uh, there simply was too much work to be done on the roofs. We did have very extensive discussions with one solar developer, uh, one, of their, um, one of their roof builders, who had proposed using foam as a cheaper alternative to simply cover over our roofs and all of their flaws. And that was actually a very interesting idea, uh, but after much analysis was deemed uh, to be neither effective nor economically uh, viable um, as a sound solution. But we are happy, of course, to always explore every idea and every solution that's brought to our attention. I know that through all of these discussions and through meetings with our own experts that we are making an informed decision that it's in the best interest of the district to move forward. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's a decision about roofs. It's a decision to spend $13.6 million on a part of our infrastructure that doesn't give us more teachers or more counselors or more technology or any of the other things that make us feel good about educating our students. The bond does allow us, though, to keep moving forward. We need to stop spending the amounts we spend each year chasing leaks and creating a patchwork of roofing structure that in the end will simply find a way to keep leaking. We need to accept that the time is now to undertake a project of this significance because all of the evidence we've gathered to date informs us without hesitation that this is the right thing to do. And we must find a way to accomplish our need for new roofing without cutting into an operating budget that was never intended to fund an expenditure of this size all at the same time. Since the first referendum, we've discussed and considered all of the feedback that we received from the public regarding your appetite to fund a bond for various purposes. When presented with the facts of the need for a bond to fund only our roofs, 
rather than the alternative of cutting back programs to replace a few roofs each year for the next several years. We're hopeful that you will in fact agree that this is what is right for the district and you will allow us to replace what so many of you have termed a need or an essential through a bond issuance so that we can continue to provide the high quality of education that Westfield is accustomed to receiving through our operating budget. With that, I'll open the floor to questions or comments on the presentation. Yeah. Um, I too will be in voting in favor of the bond. When the bond was defeated last month, I originally was in favor of waiting until March to go out for another bond. I thought that we should spend that time engaging the community, educating the community, um, and as to, the, as to the need to replace the roofs. However, I simply don't think that we can wait. By March, we'll be at the end of our budget process, our planning for next year. I think it is only fair to let the community know what to expect if this new bond is defeated. As Dr. Dolan explained here tonight, the board will need to make cuts in the operating budget to, pr to replace at least the high school roof, which has active leaks, for a cost of approximately $4 million. Parents and students should be told what to expect. As Dr. Dolan said, we will need to cut 50 staff members. These cuts will include teachers, and class size at every level will grow. In the last two community surveys that we've done, class, small class size was the number one priority of parents. Also, extracurricular activities. These are probably the priority of our students. will be cut in both fine arts and athletics. Counselors, librarians, and technology staff will be cut. And I just really think that it's fair that we should let the community know now that we will be making these cuts and not wait until March to let them know that we have to move forward with these cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. I will be voting in favor of the roof bond referendum that is before us this evening as well. As a member of both the facilities and finance committees during this process, I've heard countless hours of discussion about our infrastructure needs and the available ways to finance them. I am confident that our construction experts have provided us with the relevant information from which to form an opinion. Our roofs need to be repaired. I'm confident that we've developed a plan that will get those roofs fixed and allow us to be able to maintain our programs and to provide for the many other infrastructure needs that we have in the district. I am confident that we have taken into consideration all of the feedback that we have, heard, that we have received from the public before and after the last bond ever referendum. I'm confident that now is the time. We have heard our financial experts tell us that bond rates are at an all-time low and that construction costs will also work in our favor. Putting this off will only add additional risks to a project that must be done. I'm confident that the residents of our town will continue to support the needs of our district. I fully understand that economic times continue to be difficult for many members of our community and for that reason I will continue to work hard to make sure that the budget dollars that you fund will be used in the most efficient way possible. We are always searching for ways to reduce our costs, yet maintain the best programs possible for the 6,300 kids of our school system. Thank you. Rich. First, I'd echo everything that Rich and Ann and Mark have said. I will be voting in favor of this bond. Um, this isn't easy. And clearly, I think it's important to point out that the Board of Education hears what the town says and clearly heard the results of the last defeat. But the facts are the facts. And we've spent a great deal of time, um, not just in, over the last few weeks, but as Rich said, over the last few years, hearing over and over about the troubles with our roofs. And over the last few weeks, we've seen right up close and personal that this exists. These roofs have to be fixed. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and it has to happen now. And especially, it has to happen uh, at a number of the schools next summer. And I think that the plan that's been laid out, is, is it makes perfect sense. And I think it's also fair to just put it out there, as Ann has said, that if we are unable to get this done, we will have to make cuts. And, I, and personally, as, you know, as chair of the Ad Hoc Technology Committee, I don't want to see us go backwards. 
I think we have, to use the football analogy, we're halfway down the field. We have made some tremendous leaps. There are some really exciting things going on in the schools. I was at the uh, high school PTSO meeting this week, and there's just some very, very, very interesting things going on. And the staff that's been brought on board are, are doing remarkable things. But part of the plan that we laid out is to add money every single year over the next few years to make sure that we're not just throwing technology out there and not having a plan to back it. And our assistant superintendent has done some great work and I wanna see that continue. I think it's really critical, especially the little kids uh, in the elementary school that are you know, gonna be more able to use more and more of this technology going forward. I think holding them back would be a mistake. And I really hope we can pass this bond. I think the time is right. Um, it was not easy, but this time is for real, folks. We need to pass this. Gee. So, Dave, thank you. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. I know we've talked, a, you know, had several on the roofs, and, and this time around, um, you know, really gave a broader picture of um, cost per school and uh, pictures of the roofs. Um, I guess my, and, and I, I that Mitch um, talking about moving forward was a very good point. And I guess that's where I came out. Um, finally, after struggling with many thoughts of where to go uh, with supporting the, the full amount of the bond, um, and that's where I landed, that to not fully fund uh, the bond for all of the roofs makes sets us backwards and um, you know facilities finally being able to accomplish some of those projects really important ones um, all of them but you know boilers and windows and those don't go away and we did put those on hold and um, to put those all on hold again uh, with unknowns that we deal with um, moving forward so we can put it on hold we can say we'll do it in a couple years and then we could lose all our state aid again and then we have a couple of more years and then other things begin to deteriorate so we're on a really good track with technology with our facilities and it would be a, a shame to lose that momentum and with being able to replace some of our staffing where we took such a tremendous hit a couple of years ago and that was so painful um, it was awful sitting at the board table having to talk about losing counselors and losing teachers and losing extracurricular activities. Um, it, it was so painstaking, and to see that happen again um, would really be devastating. And the only other point that I wanted to make was that, um, you know, we have about a half hour, 45 minutes, where we compiled all of this information that we have talked about for years and months and weeks. I mean, ever since our last meeting, we have all been meeting, committees have been meeting, administration has, has been meeting um, constantly. We've been talking to the professionals. So I just think it's important for the public to know that it takes a village to compile all of this information and that this administration and this board is so diligent in leaving no stone unturned and asks every question possibly and and i mean every scenario i mean we have chalkboards for rich matessic and we have charts for mark friedman and we have roofs for other members to climb on and then you know practically risk their lives to really get a full view of what these roofs look like and um so i'm sure there will be questions that come back to us from the public and we always welcome them because we are so open and so honest and want the facts desperately to come out um, but just know that um a lot of work goes into the behind the scenes that you just really have no um no idea it's kind of when you until you walk the shoes you don't necessarily understand um what it's like so just to get a little little picture of um how much work goes into it so Judy. I'm proud of the work that uh, committees have done to get us to this point uh, facilities and finance to re-examine all of the data to put it in new context of um, community feedback through the defeat of the first bond attempt, um, 
the administration and our business administrator, our grounds supervisor, our um, professionals who we called in. I did go up on a few roofs. And there's nothing like seeing firsthand um, spongy areas, uh, pockets of deterioration. Uh, you can hear stories. But um, I'm a show me kid. And, uh, and it makes a significant impact when you can uh, look at the uh, disrepair of what it is we need to fix. Um, I, uh, I will vote to support this bond question. Um, I appreciate all of the um, conversation, all of the diligent um, questioning that took place around all the tables where it took place. Uh, I know that um, there were uh, many points of view that were aired and many um, arguments for different scenarios as to what approach should be taken, but um, I'm confident that um, the right approach has been designed. Um, I'd just like to reiterate what my fellow board members have said, and that is I will be voting yes for this bond. We do need our roofs. And I also want to just piggyback on something that Jane said about the unknowns and state aid has been increasing in the past few years, but we don't know if it will continue to. And it's quite possible that they could take it away and then we'd be even further back in our operating budget. And that would be really, really scary because we, won't, we would not have been able to plan for it since the state does not give us that information until the last minute. So that's one thing. And the other was something that Ginny said about there were lots of scenarios talked about. Um, mm -hmm. Anne brought up that right after the vote, she thought we should wait till March, let things settle, let collect, let's collect a lot of, inf you know, figure out more of what the people were thinking. Um, we talked about going out for less, not the full amount, and trying to pay for some of it with the operating budget. And with all of the questioning and with all of the scenarios, funding the full amount was what we feel is the best. The roofs need to be fixed. They need to be fixed now. It's, it has been put off for various reasons throughout the recent years. and. We need to do it now. We need to be bold and make the step. So. So what you learn is don't go last because everybody <laughs> says anything you want to say. <laughs> but um, just very briefly, I too will be voting in favor of the asking for the full amount uh, for the bond. And I, I think the only thing that I want to add to what was talked about was that we did not take this decision lightly at all. And I know that other, other members have said that, but we did look at not only every single roof, but every single configuration of the numbers required to fix the roofs and how get this amount for the bond and this amount for the bond and this amount for the bond. And I think it's our collective you know, conclusion in mind as well that we're not forward looking and we're not good stewards of our district's monies if we don't ask for the full amount. That there are too many question marks, there are too many programs that'll have to be cut. And um, I mean, I'm struck most of all by you know the kinds of budget cuts that will have to be made and not having been here when we did that the last time around. It's, it's not acceptable to me as a board member and it's not acceptable to me as a parent. So um, I too will be voting yes. Anyone else? All right, I would like to move uh, finance motion number one, which I'll explain, and then open it up for additional comment, allow the public to speak if they'd like, before we vote on the motion. So, I'll second. Thank you. And uh, if we could turn to that motion, it is, I'll just read it in part, a resolution providing for a special school election to be held on December 11, 2012 for consideration of a bond proposal to provide for the replacement and or restoration of roofs at the Westfield High School, Edison Intermediate School, Roosevelt Intermediate School, Franklin Elementary School, 
Jefferson Elementary School, Lincoln Early Childhood Learning Center, McKinley Elementary School, Tamaquis Elementary School, Washington Elementary School, Wilson Elementary School, Keeler Field House, and the Board of Education offices, including incidental and re related equipment and work in the amount of $13,600,000. I had a second. Are there other conversations? Ginny had seconded. Are there other questions or comments from board members with regard to the resolution itself? I have one comment. Yes. I happen to be asked by a uh, public citizen about the language that's used in the bond resolution. And th so I thought it might be worthwhile to just bring that topic up for a, a moment. Um, the language is given to us by bond, bond council. There are statutory requirements of things that have to be said within it. The uh, language does not appear all that layman friendly. Um, however, it is not up to the board to characterize it, write it, or um, we, we have no uh, say in it. So um, unfortunately, um, it is what it is, and it, it contains a factual statement of our intent and it is in a language that the, um, the state has required to execute what we want to have as a bond referendum, so. Oh, that's a great point, yeah. and, and I think we were probably all asked similar questions. Why would we put language like this on the ballot? And it is uh, specific to statutory language, it's required, and it refers really to a time when projects like this could be funded. And I, apparently there were times when school districts could have right. gotten grants but didn't and so right. you had to say that we have to say that as well the problem is there is no money available for a grant so if you just read it on its face it appears like we're not asking for money that's there the problem is the money is just not there right. we would be happy to ask we'd be happy to apply we'd be happy to wait if there was any reasonable notion that the money would be there and and in fact we had many conversations about that in the committees um, but the reality is there's nothing to wait for right now. So we're moving ahead. Thank you. Unless there are other questions or comments from the board, I'd welcome the public to comment or question on this topic only. Sure. Brendan Galligan, 651 Shack Maxson. I'd like to thank you all for your email, or quick replies to my email this afternoon. I wish I'd waited about 12 hours. Uh, answered a lot of the questions that I had uh, and actually changed my mind. Uh, I was originally against pushing forward, but seeing the actual numbers of what the cuts would look like, I'm 100% in favor now of going for one bond and really getting the projects going. Uh, I have been up on the roofs when I was a student. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> It was before your time, Dr. Dillon, you can't help. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> uh, they were the questionable then. <laughs> They've got to be worse now. Uh, also, uh, speaking to the last comment about the wording, I urge you guys to go on a public relations blitz and let everybody know that there really is no money available mm -hmm. because the conversations that I had with the last ballot when it was mailed out to everybody was, hmm, I guess Westfield's just not going to get it, so why even bother trying? Mm -hmm. Really convey the message without sounding threatening about the cuts, about the, the grants not being there. And if you can put the numbers out there about the number of positions that would be eliminated, the programs that could potentially be cut, really let everybody know what's at stake. And thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, in back. Uh, you yeah, please come to the podium. Just state your name and address. Hi, Chuck Sarah from Five Thirty Six First Street. Um, just a couple of questions on the warranties and stuff. The new roofs would they be warranted for the entire length of the the cost of the uh, bond? How uh, the old warranties, when were the old ones put on? How long were those warranties? <clears throat> um, and how were they paid for in the past? Is that, can we expect it again in 20 years? Is that 
this is normal. Sure. So, uh, Dan, I'm going to defer to you on the warranty questions, but I could speak to the funding for one second, and you could add. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, my understanding is that for full replacement in the past, bond was the way that that would have been accomplished. To repair and make minor replacements over time, that could come out of either uh, capital reserve or maintenance account uh, from time to time. And that's part of the problem we have right now is we're spending money to do minor replacements and not getting at the heart of a problem. Um, I, I can't speak too many years ago, but I think really the question of focus, in my opinion, should be how do we not get here again? And I think that was the heart of your second question, which is what can we do to prevent ourselves from being here in 20 years when we need a replacement uh, not to go out to have a bond referendum? And what we have talked about is putting money aside each year for roof replacement. And we can make some reasonable prediction as to what roofs might cost in 20 years divided by 20 and ask ourselves if we can fund that amount every year um, and what the trade-offs would be. Uh, if we don't fund 100% of it, can we fund 75% of it? What are the trade-offs? We need to have those conversations, and we need to, um, in my opinion again, make sure that we do allocate funds to what I call a sinking fund or a replacement fund, um, and not just for this, for other projects as well. Um, and we, we are trying to do that. Um, in my experience, just even in the past three years, we, we have started to maintain higher levels of maintenance reserves. Um, the statutes have allowed us to start to do that, and we've been using that money for true capital replacements, as you've heard, like boilers and bathrooms and things of that nature. So before I turn it over to Dana, did that address the final? Yeah, I, I mean, it, all of these things, some of these things at least have predictable uh, life expectancies. Sure. Right. And uh, I don't know if, I know you have a limit of what uh, reserves you can keep and stuff, but I would think that's something, and I'm not sure, I know, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't know the position, but what would be reasonable to expect and, and you know, and a lot for, as opposed to getting uh, hit with, you know. Right. Uh, Go ahead. And I would just add um, to Rich's point that Years ago, when roofs were replaced, the state funded had about 40% um, of construction costs, mm -hmm. and that disappeared four or five years ago, maybe even a little bit longer. And that was part of what created us to have such a huge hit, because 40% is quite, you know, they would match 40% of whatever your construction costs were. And that's part of the language that's now in the bond. That's the money that's dried up and no longer available so hopefully and so this is the mechanism that the state has now left for schools to go out for large capital um, projects um, so I just want to add that point that that was something different from how it used to be and maybe it will change again um, you know construction has been taking place on roadways hopefully schools will be next on the state list at least Dana, can you speak to the warranty piece? Actually, I'm going to ask George Duthie, our architect, because sure. I think he can give a more detailed response than I can about the warranties. George? Yes. <coughs> okay, I'm George Duthie, uh, Freight Tech Vice Hopkins, Duthie Architects. Uh, and what I'll say about the warranty on this particular system is a 20 year total system warranty. It is guaranteed for 20 years by the manufacturer of the system, covering the roofing and the associated components of the roofing system. Um, a far better warranty that's been available on roofing systems in the past. I remember when I started in the business, we, we received 10-year warranties on, on roofs, uh, whether it was a built-up roof or an EPDM roof. So the warranties have come a long way. So the working lifespan for the roof is 20 years. Okay, all building systems have a lifespan associated with them. With maintenance and with care, which I'm sure will be the case, uh, the roof should last longer, but I would plan for 20 years. Are all the roofs the uh, same material? The aggregate? The new roof? The existing and the new. Uh, the existing roofs are a combination. Uh, we have a lot of sprayed polyurethane foam. We have built up roofing systems. We have uh, single ply membranes. We also have um, modified roofing systems uh, with and without aggregate. There's a combination in all of the different buildings. Are we using one manufacturer for the new roofs? 
Yes, the proposed manufacturer for the new roofing system is C-Plast. It's a two-ply modified SBN, SBS system. It is the same system that was used on the high school on the science edition that was constructed in 2000. It is a very high performing and is an excellent roofing system. Uh, and it is a premium roofing system, but is high performing. So the answer is C-Plast, uh, SBS modified a two-ply system. As a basis of design. Mm -hmm. The warranties. Yeah. Well, what are their still in existence? What are the old warranties are still in existence? Oh, uh, yeah, George, so there was another portion of the question okay. regarding the existing warranties or the old warranties to the extent any of them are left on the areas we're doing work. Um, you do still have some existing areas under warranty at this time. Some of the areas that are under warranty actually have some warranties that will take you into, uh, you know, later in the, in the uh, teens, okay, the 2018 range or into the 2020 uh, are not proposed to be replaced. Those warranties are still in effect. Uh, most of the roofs that are being replaced, I can't think of any right now that have any active warranties on them. All the roofs that are being replaced are not covered under warranty at this time. Do they have uh, proposals where they can take the existing roof, like a membrane roof, slice it, put the new one down, and still give you a 20-year warranty on the new one? No. Um, the, the technical issues with the roofs that we have right now, uh, water infiltration is our largest problem right now. Uh, really lack of a, um, what we would call a uh, induced slope, okay, which is a necessary drainage plane that we need on the roof which is a code requirement to drain the roofs. So we have two issues. We have water saturation in the underlying roofing systems, and there are multiple roofing systems on some of the buildings, along with uh, a lack of pitch to allow water that falls from the rainfall onto the roof to drain. Okay, so those two problems in and of themselves really make the existing roof surface unsuitable to accept new roofing. It would be an option if the roofs were dry and there was a slope there would be, there are some systems that are available, they don't have 20-year warranties, by the way, uh, that would work, but they will not work in this case. Okay. Did you have more questions? Or you? Not right now. Okay. You can always email us if you have more. Okay. As, or at the end of the meeting if you have more. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other members of the public? Okay, seeing no one else, any other board comments or questions? All right, roll call. Rich Matasek? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstad? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Mitchell Slater? Yes. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Brings us to Superintendent Report Number Two. Number Two, a very important <laughs> one, actually. Um, the second uh, Superintendent Report for tonight actually talks about the um, our student performance on state assessments. Uh, those assessments, in general, are conducted in the spring of the year. So this is a report on how our students performed on state assessments in the spring of 2012. And to present that overview, we have our Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum Instruction and Programs, Mr. Paul Panera. Hi. Good evening, everybody. Nice to be here to talk to you about our student performance. So as Dr. Dolan mentioned, each year um, every school district in the state is required to administer standardized tests in grades 3 through 8, 11 at the high school level, uh, as well as biology in high school end of year course. Tonight I'll share the 2012 results with you and I'll be adding SAT and AP results as well. Uh, these fall outside of the New Jersey Department of Education battery of assessments, but they're important indicators of our uh, student preparedness for college and beyond. So first, let's clarify some terms. When we look at the student performance data, it's helpful to have something to compare it to. So uh, there is something called the district factor group. This is a classification uh, of a district that associates academic performance with community characteristics such as affluence and parent education. There are uh, district factor groups ranging from A all the way to J. Uh, Westfield is an I. 
and then there are a handful of J's. Um, again, uh, parent education, uh, median income, home values, those kinds of things go into uh, how dif district factor groups are designated. And there on the bottom, it just says uh, what I mentioned, that we are an I district. Others include in our area, New Providence, Mountainside, Scotch Plains, Fanwood. There are three levels of performance. Partially proficient, that's when students fall under the uh, 200 threshold. Proficient, which is passing uh, 200 or above. Advanced proficient, which is demonstrating advanced understanding of the core content standards, and that starts at 250 and above up to 300. Uh, clusters, you'll hear me talk a little bit about clusters today. Uh, those are the specific skill sets that are tested in each of, of the assessments. So here's an example of the clusters that are involved in language arts and their scoring. So uh, writing and reading are tested, and those add up to the points on the total points in the bottom. And then you see under writing, we have expository, speculative, persuasive, explanatory. Um, not every cluster is tested at every grade level. As you can see there, in sixth grade, it transitions from the expos and speculative to persuasive and explanatory. Uh, reading straight through uh, involves comprehension and working with text, as well as analyzing text. OK, and uh, these are the clusters for math. Number and numerical operations, geometry and measurement, patterns and algebra, data analysis, probability, and discrete mathematics. OK, and here's some of the ways we use the results. The data. We analyze it to target instruction. We check for alignment with standards. And we can monitor, monitor consistency of instruction from year to year. Okay. But while the test results can suggest areas to look at, we need to keep in mind that the test can be a moving target. Any given grade level assessment may change. Skills can be emphasized differently from year to year. The level of difficulty for one reason or another may shift or change. Uh, grade level cohorts of students change from year to year. And uh, scoring protocols may change from year to year as well. And here's how we drill down when analyzing the data. Dr. Dolan and I visited all the principals in our data tour, data tour at the beginning of the year. And uh, we shared with them the data that you'll see tonight. So in fact, we drilled it down to the school level as well. Um, so we shared with them their individual school data and uh, as well as the supervisors. And then the principals will share that, those with the teachers, analyzing the results and drilling it down to where we're looking at the clusters I just showed you and ultimately the individual students uh, who may be targeted for intervention. Okay. And one, one comment, there's, uh, there's a sample of the teachers. If you look, you'll see some charts in that one teacher's hands. Um, and that's what I'm going to be showing you in a minute, but it shows you some you know, multiple years of data as well as comparing with the I districts and so forth. And um, it might, might be worth mentioning that uh, I, I mentioned that individual students can be targeted for intervention, but the better we get it, uh, analyzing clusters specific skill sets then we can look for the individual growth I mean we always do but we want to really get it down to a science all students should be growing all the time um, and not just for intervention so that we can uh, pass it as a test okay so uh, here we'll begin with grades three through five over the last five years our elementary schools to make sense of the test results it helps to look at these results over time and in comparison with other districts like Westfield, as I had mentioned just a moment ago. That's where district factor group comparisons and longitudinal charting can come in handy. So let's start with a series of comparative data over multiple years. And uh, we'll use this chart sort of as our key for the coming ones. The blue will always be uh, appropriately so Westfield. Uh, I district averages will be noted in red and averages from the state are in green. Um, certainly the, the state averages will be falling most likely toward the bottom on the charts. That's why it's important not to just compare us to say the state overall but to a slice of our uh, peers, academic peers throughout the state. So uh, when we met with the uh, administrators, Dr. Dole and I, to review the results, we looked for trends, uh, maybe anomalies, 
something that jumps out at us. Here we begin with grade three, uh, language arts total passing averages. You'll see that Westfield's district third graders follow a similar trend line to the state and I districts, um, but the Westfield students perform above these comparative results. So something like that is pretty standard when we look through these charts, meaning that there tends to be a trend line that's similar. It's when they start bouncing around a little bit that things jump out for us. When you break this down, say, by subgroup or school by school, you see things jump more because the smaller the population that you're charting against larger populations, uh, the more fluctuation you can anticipate. Uh, but from the district perspective, all of our grade three students combined, their averages are at, uh, above both the state and the I districts. And we'll move it along from, so you'll see the total passing and then you'll move to the advanced proficient. So what we'll do is the slide for the total passing of students and then we'll show another slide and that will be advanced proficient. We'll do that right through grade eight. Oh, actually at 11, the HESPA as well. So here we see now the advanced proficient. Notice the scale on the left is smaller. It's not zero to 100, it's zero to 20. Um, typically the language arts advanced proficient level is somewhere in there, whether it be at the state average, uh, the I district average or ourselves. So there you have our grade three average for 2012. And again, it's over five years. So you're not seeing the same students, but you're seeing the same grade. And uh, that, that's one way uh, to, uh, for us to analyze the data. But again, we do have to keep in mind that those students change every year. So that's really a snapshot of third grade over five years. Okay, so we'll move on to grade. Oh, that's right, we're still in grade three. Now there's math, sorry. Total passing math. Take a look at that. And now advanced. Math for grade three. Now that would be an example where the line does not follow the typical arc relative to the I district. So we can look at that. And uh, that's one of the areas that we've highlighted for us to look at. And so one of the first things we'll look at is mean scale score and see if um, that fluctuation, which isn't really a lot when you look at the uh, numbers on the left, but still it doesn't really follow the trend line that we're accustomed to. So we'll take a look at it, see if the mean scale scores. In other words, did we have uh, a handful of students that just missed by a point or two with regard to proficient or advanced, uh, or is there maybe something else that we can make sense of? So uh, the this, this supervisor and myself and the principals will be looking at that together shortly. Okay, and here's total passing in language arts for grade four. And uh, advanced proficient in grade four. We'll just glance. I mean, you, you have the packet. We'll put it up on the uh, website as well. Um, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what our analysis looks like. So we look at this. We look for things that jump out. And there we have total passing grade four math. Advanced proficient grade four math. Um, let's go to the next one. So science. Uh, science is also tested in fourth grade and eight. And earlier I showed you the clusters for language arts and math. Uh, science clusters include life science, physical science, earth science, knowledge, and application. And so here's our total passing for grade four science. And we'll take a look at the advanced proficient. <laughs> And now we'll move on to grade five. So here's language arts, grade five, total passing. And advanced proficient. Okay. And math, total passing. And math, advanced proficient. Near the end, I'll point out a couple of over uh, you know, overview type highlights. One thing that is for the most part um, constant is that Westfield schools are performing at or above that I district and when they don't certainly look, look close at it especially if it's a trend over time. Um, but it, it's a good thing for us to all see over time that we're very consistent in performing above that I district line. Okay, so uh, we can now move on to the intermediate schools, Edison and Roosevelt. So that's, uh, that district average includes those two schools together. 
So here we have language arts, total passing grade six, sort of the same drill. The blue line is Westfield uh, Intermediate Schools, and that's relative to the I district, which is just below it, and the state, which is below both. And now here's advanced proficient. It's another one that we'll want to take a close look at. Even though on the left we see the difference is maybe two points in 2011, two and a half, and maybe a point, point and a half in 2012, um, still, we need to look at that. Okay, grade six math total passing, and advanced proficient. Okay, there's grade seven, total passing language arts. And there's language arts advanced proficient grade seven. Total passing math grade seven. And advanced proficient grade seven math. Okay, so there's grade eight, which is a tightly <laughs> woven spiral between uh, Westfield and the I districts. And there's the advanced for language arts. There's math total passing. And there's advanced proficient math. Science, as mentioned before, fourth and eighth grade we test science. There's total passing. That's a tight connection between uh, Westfield and the I districts and advanced proficient fluctuation in 2011. You can look at that, but 2012 seems to be back up. Okay, that brings us to the high school. New Jersey high schools take the high school, uh, I'll do a little, you can keep that one up there, I'll do an intro. So. New Jersey high schools take the high school proficiency assessment, which is a graduation requirement. They also take the end of course biology test. In addition to the standardized test, we'll also look at Westfield High School's student performance on SAT, the Scholastic Aptitude Test, which is widely used by colleges as an evaluative metric for admissions. The Advanced Placement Test, which is accepted by some colleges for college credit, but is also used as an indicator of rigor of course load on student transcripts. Some colleges will also allow students to place out of basic level college courses if they perform well on the AP test. So here's our first chart of the HESPA. Uh, traditionally, since it is a high school require, um, graduation requirement, the HESPA is maybe considered a, a less formative assessment than maybe the New Jersey ASK tests. Um, everyone has to pass this without, you know, uh, everyone has to pass the HESPA in order to graduate, so it's a graduation requirement, except for those few who may have to go through an alternate process, um, which requires work all through the year. Our percentage in that is minuscule over the years. Um, so as you can see here, we're consistently in our total passing above 95, 96, okay, so and very close to the I district average. And advanced proficient, that's where we are relative to I district and state. And then we can look at our math total passing and our math advanced proficient. Okay. Here's our biology total passing and our advanced proficient. And uh, here's our SAT. Now, the uh, Westfield turned green on the SATs um, <laughs> for the sake of these three charts. They, uh, you'll have to reverse your thinking color-wise. But so the, the top chart, the top line will always be Westfield. Let's hope it stays that way, but at least for the next three slides. So uh, Westfield verbal, uh, that shows you a five-year trend line. The 2012 I-District averages are just not available yet, um, but it shows pretty high performance. I mean, those numbers are tight on the left, so it might not be as dramatic as that all looks, um, but those are still very strong scores relative to our peers, and really when you think about uh, the importance of the SAT, at least as a, an admissions indicator, um, it's nice to see that there's even more separation for the DFG averages there than uh, maybe we would see in the advanced proficient categories on just the standardized annual testing. Uh, so there's our verbal. Next one is our math. And the one after that will be our writing. So very, very strong. Uh, we rank Westfield High School performers in the top 20 
regularly. I'm off uh, book now, so. <laughs> but I just, I do remember this number from when we were looking at uh, some results earlier in the year. But within the uh, Westfield High School, we'll, uh, we'll place in the top 20, usually 16-ish in SAT scores for the entire state. So that's really strong. Good for us. Um, so there's advanced placement. A number of courses offered in the last couple years. Uh, one of the metrics or thumbnails for uh, strong performance in AP advanced placement tests are if you score three and above. So that's sort of like the uh, cutoff for what's considered strong. So our Westfield students in 2010 had an average of 90. 90% 90, uh, 90 of the scores were three and above. And uh, that's relative to the NI district average of 81.8. And uh, in 2011, it was 89.2 versus 84.2. Okay, so what does it all mean? With few exceptions, the Westfield Public School District consistently performs at or above its district factor group peers. Um, also, there are no cluster skill areas with a district average below the DFG mean. what the results show at Westfield's individual school levels. There are two skill areas below the DFG mean at individual schools, in language arts, writing, and in math, number, and numerical operations. So, so we drill down from the district data and we get to um, a situation where we have five elementary schools have a mean score in writing that is below the DFG. So that's virtually what it suggests to us is we need uh, to do some professional development to bring a very consistent program of writing to our students so that we can uh, see, see those uh, clusters be above the mean rather than below it. Uh, as you all know, we're investing a lot of time, energy, and commitment and spirit in our literacy initiative that is the Columbia University's Teachers College program and that has been strong, uh, moving strongly ahead since the summer. So, you know, that particular cluster, the writing in general, was highlighted uh, some time ago, last year when I first got here. In December, I already heard people talking about the importance of examining such an initiative, and um, we're very happy that it's, that it's underway. We really believe that we can bolster our writing performance at the elementary level. In mathematics, it wasn't necessarily uh, something that we would consider a district-wide cluster issue, let's say, but uh, there were two schools that uh, had a number and numerical operations below the DFG mean. So um, those principals and this math supervisor and myself, and, you know, we'll look closely at uh, what the delivery of instruction looks like. We'll look, is it a curriculum issue? Is it a consistency issue? Is it an alignment issue? Some of the things I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that uh, the test data can help us identify one of those areas. So uh, the three areas of intervention, I stole my own thunder. So the first one is the Columbia University Teachers College Literacy Initiative. And uh, as I mentioned, for the, for the math clusters in those two schools, we have to get in there and look very closely at individual students, individual classrooms, and get a good sense of of what's going on in there and then uh, provide the support that we need for students and resources and teachers and professional development uh, you know to, to bolster that instruction as well and then the third area of intervention is annual we provide uh, help for partially proficient students and we do that by examining individual student performance data and then appropriately providing some kind of intervention support um, more than ever we're, we're uh, making an effort to really drill down into the specific performance of students over time, individual students. Um, you know, we do believe that the individual student improvement plan is, is a strong model, which means that we don't just necessarily look at groups of kids uh, because every student is different and each of their challenges may be different. Um, that being said, while we always have an eye on on the intervention model for students who might not be passing according to the standardized test you know, requirements, uh, we still are also committed to moving everyone up relative to their current position. In other words, everyone grows. The reason I dropped the growth 
uh, term a couple times tonight is next year um, when we're doing our presentation there will be a different state uh, a different state model for gauging what what signifies good teaching good schools uh, high performance and what I mean by that is it will no longer be well here's your passing because e even if you consider our partially proficient students we may have had many that were partially proficient by a point or two we may have had uh, many that were partially proficient by a lot. Um, that number doesn't tell us much. We may have had partially proficient students climb from a 160 in third grade to a 180 in fourth grade to passing the next grade. That matters a lot and it might not always show up. So the state has taken that into consideration as well as this whole new park assessment uh, scenario. So we're going to start hearing more of that language. We've been exposed to it already, but it's the SGP, the student growth profile that we may be looking at next year. I, I respectfully ask people don't share that with my secretaries who've spent the last eight months compiling DFG comparisons. <laughs> uh, and I kept telling them, this is an investment in the future. We'll have this every year. You'll only have to add one more year. Um, although I met one of them may be watching at home, so uh, I'll, I'll bring cupcakes tomorrow, what can I say? But it, it is important. I do, I do stress with, um, I do thank them, and I, and I thank anybody who's contributed to all of this. But, uh, you know, I say to my staff on, on, uh, often, this is among, looking at this data is among the most important things we can do. Yes, it's tedious. Yes, it's, it's uh, time consuming. But uh, we can't necessarily provide the excellent instruction and support that all of our students uh, deserve if we don't know where they're at for real and what it all means. And uh, so, you know, I can't stress enough how important that is to us, and I, I want you to know that we believe in that as well. So this moving forward to this student growth profile, that will give us other options too. I mean, we're go the, the state will be looking at uh, how many students are brought from one area to the next, and it will be a different kind of metric than the I district type of scenario, but um, actually like how that captures the essence of, of a full, uh, I think it captures the essence of all of our students as, as a unit moving forward instead of the ones that have made it and the ones who haven't and the ones that you know are part of passing the ones who aren't you know we're just hoping that everyone can continue to grow and uh, and reach their individual potential so uh, with all that in mind thank you thank you thank you questions or comments I had a, a question on um, just trying to understand the results and sort of lag time. So mm -hmm. when you say that there's you know, five elementary schools had a, a lower evaluation in writing, for example, is that indicative of an issue this year that you could correct this year? Or is that, to me, that just feels more like something in the system that you know, maybe you already addressed it with last year's actions mm -hmm. and it's just manifest in these scores right now. So you're chasing something that doesn't exist or maybe the right. contrary you know you're well, I don't know well, what, right well you know chasing the moving target is something you want to avoid it, the writing issue is not necessarily a moving target for us in Westfield and here's why um, that trend line if, if you looked at the clusters over years it, it's pretty close but since we consistently function uh, at or above I district averages whether they be individual clusters or or larger test results um, that one has been consistent over a few years, so it wasn't a one-year deal. In fact, when I got here last year, there was uh, a series of spot writing workshops going on. Um, Dr. Weissman and the curriculum office uh, split the uh, resources and invested in some targeted writing instruction that uh, we feel provided benefit. Uh, what we realized in that process looking closely at it between uh, you know Tim Harrison as well as all the elementary teachers that the new curriculum as it was revised last year is a balanced literacy curriculum and the best way to deliver that in a consistent way was to have a consistent approach that not just was handled school by school but district wide so we feel strongly that the articulation that allows articulation um, opportunities the fact that when teachers talk about expectations and and grade level reading that they're speaking a similar language so you know the, the first part of your question is how do we avoid um, making you know that dealing with that one-shot deal each year you look for that trend and so that trend was 
that trend was noticed, bef you know, before even last year, and they were starting to make some investments into it, uh, resources, dedicated, dedicated <coughs> some resources, and um, once that curriculum that Tim Harrison and the group did such a fine job on uh, came out, we recognized that, uh, you know, we, we needed to revamp and, and refresh the, the instruction of our readers and writers workshops. Thank you. So how long do you think that it'll take before we, we see a, an impact? I mean, I imagine that when we set out for goals, we don't set out for goals to have five of the elementary schools below mm -hmm. the mean, right? right. So, well, you know, it's the DFG mean. Let's, yeah. You know, so, I mean, we Regardless of the amount of goal, right? <laughs> but, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, whatever we're comparing to, right? Right. right. That would be a good one. Um, and uh, I, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I, don't, I, I wouldn't set the uh, the lines, you know, in, in the NFL. But I mean, it, it is speculative. But you would think um, it's, there's a certain aspect of logic and common sense that, with all of this effort, that we would see that small gap either close or even go away. Um, I expect that, I'm hopeful for it, and we're going to be assessing the program all along the way this year um, to see that it's not, that that learning curve doesn't have to be something that impacts students at all. That, you know, if we're implementing and supporting, that it will uh, benefit students right away. And so, <coughs> I guess that's my way of saying, I expect that very small gap to be closed or completely Maybe we'll even see something even more dramatic, but so this time will tell, but that's my expectation. Okay. Thanks. So I just want to thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, I you know, have sat at the table for many years now, and as a parent, testing always makes me a little crazy. I feel like our kids are just constantly being tested. And um, your presentation helps to remind me that there is value and that it does um, you know, bring forward uh, valuable information that we then do make changes. You know, it just isn't there to you know, make us crazy and have our kids obsess over, did I get my scores or you know, anything, uh, anything like that. So thank you, because it, it was well presented. Yeah. Oh, they had your hand up before, sorry. Anyone else? Right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Well, Thank you. So are we benefiting from wireless um, presentations there? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> well done. And we do have one additional uh, superintendent report. The, um, um, the state requires that every public school district report on um, the number of incidents of violence, vandalism, harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and substance abuse. And this is one area where um, the state truly is very careful about their definitions for all of this. Um, and it's an office actually entrenched in that uh, is a very organized office. So uh, all districts, again, are required to, re to report this. But if I, if I can for just a minute focus on the Westfield Code of Conduct. Um, and we certainly work very hard on our academics in the district, but we also work really very hard um, to establish a climate that is um, supportive for students and that um, is a climate that allows students to reach their potential. And so our code of conduct um, states, and the code of conduct is, is written uh, with input from the community. So we believe a school district excels when all members exhibit strong character, including integrity and honesty, work ethic, and sportsmanship. And this is something we try in so many different ways, in the way we conduct our classes, in the way we treat each other, in the assemblies we bring in, um, in our work with parents. Um, we really do try to work on this, and in the way we discipline our students as well. So the state requirements, um, since the, um, just since last year actually, it used to be I reported this um, once a year, but there's now a requirement to do it twice a year, and the state is very specific as to the dates I have to um, report about, and I'll get to that in a moment. And um, before, harassment, intimidation, bullying <coughs> was not pulled out as a separate issue at all, but that changed last year with the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights. So um, that is now, uh, you'll see that as part of this presentation tonight. So here are some numbers, and if you look, the first column um, is, the, is actually the time period I'm reporting on tonight. It was from January 1st, 2012 to June 
30th, the end of the school year 2012. So that's a six, six months of our academic year. Those are the new numbers I'm providing. That second column there that started July 1st, 2011 and continued to the end of the 2011 year, those numbers um, were reported last spring. I reported those numbers. And, it, and as you can tell, it started, it's a six month period, but since July and August are not school months, uh, truly, those numbers really only represent four months of the school year, but those are the time requirements that we have to follow according to the state. So during this time period, there were 17 instances of violence, vandalism, and substance abuse. From those 17, now, an incident can have more than one student, so if you start to add up and it's higher than 17, it is because there are multiple students in some of the uh, incidents. And uh, so you can see that there were four where the police were notified and there was no complaint. Um, sometimes when there's uh, not a complaint, sometimes it has to do with the fact it could be vandalism. And we don't always, we're not always able to tell who created uh, the vandalism. Often we can track it down, but not always. Um, uh, Short-term suspensions and um, long-term suspensions, the, the state law on long-term expense suspensions changed in the last few years and is very, very specific about what a district has to do if a student is uh, suspended for a long period of time. So the most frequently used actions taken this past the six months of the uh, last six months of the school year were police notified and also short-term suspension. Now we get to a breakdown between the offender information and the victim information. We're required to report whether there involves regular education students or students with disabilities. And you do look for trends there. Um, so for example, I mean, one of the ones you, you do look for patterns, and you certainly don't want to see an overabundance of students with a disability being a victim, because that sometimes can be a reason why they are targeted. So that's certainly something we look for. And also, you also look to see, both for regular education and special education students, are there trends within groups of students or, or, or classes of students where um, something must not be right because there's so many incidents of it. So that's something that we do we do look for. But with these numbers in this particular year, we did not find a pattern. Again, this represents students in all of our schools. This is not just the high school, this is all of our schools. Okay, the next section of the report requires um, that I report on harassment, intimidation, and bullying. Um, New Jersey does have the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights. It's a pretty powerful law, and it's something that we take to heart here. Um, last year, we reported a number of times on the amount of training that was provided, and that training continues. Uh, just last week, all of the administrators received additional training in harassment, intimidation, and bullying. The board actually has some um, uh, scheduled in the coming weeks for training for board members. And um, students, um, and it's first of all, new staff also receive tra training to make sure that they are aware of the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights. And students also receive training in their classrooms and in their schools, both by teachers, by counselors, and by individuals we bring in um, to the schools. Uh, we continue to provide online resources regarding harassment, intimidation, and bullying. You know, sometimes I find that, um, you know, we have uh, students who are really doing pretty well in life, and then maybe something does happen that it would tug at the heartstrings of any adult, especially a parent. So we need to have that information online so a parent can go to that. When that incident happens, let's just say it's a Saturday afternoon, that they can get some guidance as to, to what might be good for them to do with their, with, their, uh, with their child to address an issue. So we continue to provide online information. It's actually under the, the parent tab on the website. And if you look there, there is information regarding bullying prevention. And we continue to have uh, ongoing meetings at each building of our school safety, safety teams um, to monitor, to look at the data that's being collected about bullying incidents um, and to determine if there are some areas um, that need to be addressed. And in fact, last year our school safety teams, especially in two schools, were able to identify a pattern um, where they needed to address um, in those two instances, there were small groups of students who had just developed a really bad way of interacting. Um, 
they um, they just gotten into bad habits truthfully and so we worked with those students and with the parents also about what are positive ways to interact um, as opposed to writing things on the internet or twittering things um, that were negative about others um, so um, that was a focus in two of our schools last year so if you look when the uh, the second column under the number of invest investigations for harassment intimidation and bullying when the law first went into effect in the beginning of the school year, uh, not just Westfield, but districts across New Jersey saw quite a large number of incidents. Um, we had 50, and by, the, um, by January to June, that number of reported investigations had gone to 26. I do think a lot of that had to do with the training that we provided. Uh, with more students understanding that we were taking this seriously and that they were being investigated and perhaps some students stopped and thought twice. Um, and I think also in the very beginning there were also people who perhaps were misusing it just a little bit and they learned that what the harassment, intimidation, and bullying law was. So I think there were two pieces that changed the numbers. Out of all those investigations, out of the 26 investigations, eight of them were determined to have been harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And let me be clear on something. Out of the 26, we certainly found that there were some things that were wrong, but they might not have been harassment, intimidation, and bullying. There might have been somebody um, being dis disrespectful to someone. There might have been someone who used inappropriate language, but it wasn't bullying. So they, those students who did something wrong still received consequences. It was just not a determined to be a harassment, intimidation, or bullying case. But there were eight of them where it was determined that, in fact, a child had felt intimidated or bullied. And um, all of those were conducted within the 10-day investigation period that's required. And all of those uh, were brought to the uh, Board of Education, and they affirmed those decisions. By the way, every harassment, intimidation, and bullying investigation does come before the board at the end of the process. Um, but that number eight just says that of the eight that were confirmed, they were all confirmed by the board. That's what that number indicates there. All right, also under harassment, intimidation, and bullying, um, <coughs> the, the Anti-Bullying Bill of Rights um, requires that there be a characteristic that is being used by the bully um, against a student, that, that a student is being picked on, bullied, intimidated because of a characteristic or a perceived characteristic um, our numbers here actually are somewhat similar to the state, and you'd certainly look for patterns here. In the second half of the year last year, we had one student where uh, they were um, bullied because of their race. The other issues did not come up during the second half of the year. Gender, we did have two um, issues, and if you note, and beginning of the year we had five. This is actually an area that's not quite a trend, but we are looking at because there were um, some um, some girls who were picked on because they were uh, they were picked on by boys because of their gender. So not a, not a full trend, but something we were monitoring. Sexual orientation was one. Uh, mental, physical, or sensory disability. There were two instances of that. And then other distinguishing characteristics were five. If you looked at the state data that was released just a week or two ago, by far the largest category was other distinguishing characteristic. By far, that was the highest number. And looking at what district responses were, it included individual counseling and student conferences and parent conferences. Now, I think sometimes people don't realize that is still a big deal to have a parent conference. I think people think that it was only years ago where your parent took it seriously when they came in. Not the case. It, it is a big deal when your parent is called in, has to meet with the principal, and talking about uh, behavior that's not acceptable. Uh, it, it truly is uh, powerful in almost every instance. Suspensions and suspension of privileges. Suspension of privileges is certainly different whether you are in second grade or you are in 11th grade or middle school, um, but those can be very powerful as well. If you're a second grader and you're not allowed to go to lunch for two days, that is monumental. You know? um, and part of it, if you're really trying to get someone to change, is figuring out what does matter to that person and what can you do that's going to get the message in, no, that's not acceptable. That's not acceptable here. 
Okay, and then they looked at uh, what is the mode or type of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, that electronic communication. There are days where I would have liked to have been a superintendent before any technology. <laughs> <laughs> While I love it, um, it is difficult when young people have all kinds of technology in their hands and it is so easy to hurt somebody very quickly. Uh, it used to be you could write a note and pass it to your friend and maybe three people saw it. Well, now there's so many things you can do electronically and all of a sudden a couple hundred people saw it. Um, so that is something we provide constant um, reminders to students and assemblies to students and when they're at the computers we remind them and I'm sure parents are doing the same thing but it's an ongoing uh, project. And very, very important, every school has its own anti-bullying specialist. Um, they are certainly a key contact person for either students or for parents or for anyone who has either questions or something to report. Um, this is posted on our website, but if ever someone does not know and does not remember who the anti-bullying specialist is, please just tell an adult in the school or in the district and we will make sure we address it quickly. But um, that is posted in num numerous places because when a child is feeling intimidated or bullied, it is important and we need to know that quickly and we need to figure out a way to stop that so that child feels safe and that um, child can do what they're supposed to do in school as opposed to being intimidated. So it's, it's very important work, so please make sure we know if you're aware of anything. Thank you. Questions or comments? Um, I know this is the required by the state. Yes. But um, I want more information, um, maybe not tonight, um, on what the school level safety teams are finding about the climate of the schools, um, what their plans are to address needs or support students and teachers and everybody in the building treating each other with respect. Mm -hmm. and climate surveys, not only per school, but per district. I just want to bring that up again. Okay. Well, I've, we can certainly yeah. see to, um, to have a follow-up when, uh, when it makes sense to schedule it and have, I would imagine it would be helpful to have some members of school safety teams here to talk mm -hmm. about their work. Yeah, I'm very supportive of that conversation. Um, I had been concerned that this would possibly be the only opportunity the board had to focus on this topic. And um, so it would be beneficial to me if the topic goes onto the agenda again, um, specifically um, saying in another way, but addressing um, the anti-bullying legislation, our response, the process, what we learn from it, how we doing it differently, what our um, how has our practice been altered for more successful outcomes with getting to the heart of um, fair and um, comprehensive uh, investigation outcomes? And then also, to the same point as Roseanne's interest, uh, my personal interest in conducting school climate surveys so we can assess uh, perspectives, not only from students and staff, um, but from the community and from parents. Um, and I don't know how we fit that in or where it fits, it, if it's a goal, if it's just an ongoing um, uh, understanding of wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, uh, we certainly have different techniques these days and we could, uh, I believe collect information, not without some pain, but <laughs> you know, less. Um, it, it would take less effort than in the past, and I think it's uh, critical for us to understand uh, what all of our uh, different participants are thinking, saying, and uh, feeling. Um, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Thank you. That concludes our superintendent report. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, it does. Aww. It must be fall. The next three years. <laughs> <laughs> now fall always has chock full of superintendent. You're done? <laughs> <laughs> Got it.
I would move to the minutes and ask the board to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on October 2nd, 2012 and the private minutes of October 2nd, 2012. Second. Thank you. Any conversation or comments on the minutes? All, right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? All right. Personnel, Jane. Okay, I would like to make a motion to ask for the board's approval of personnel items number one through 13. I'll second it. Yes. Lights. Okay. Questions, comments? Um. Yes, question number seven. The additional 20% compensation. Sorry, I don't know the individual, so I don't know what class. Mark Lazaro. Lazaro. I believe that's for, um, is that advanced debate? Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Advanced debate. Okay. And number 12, I want to thank you for stating that we're paying for the substitute nurse for the overnight field trip out of funds reimbursed from field trip money. Okay. So that's uh, something that I had to uh, questions about previously and I do appreciate that 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 information comes along with the uh, the recommendation to approve Anyone else? Okay. Rich Matesic yes Ann Carey yes Jane Clancy yes Mark Friedman yes Roseanne Kerstead yes Ginny lights yes Gretchen Oleg yes Mitchell Slater yes this brings us to facilities Jane no additional information. All right. Long range planning. Jenny. I regret to say I don't have anything still on the calendar. We're, we're busy, I think, doing the right things, and um, we'll get back on the calendar as soon as we can. Thank you very much. Policy is for the same. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to table these for first reading, if that's okay, because right. of yep. the length of the meeting and the things we have after. All right. How about the? And, uh, oh item wait, I'm one. sorry. If you the do have final. comments, the if you if you do have comments, uh, maybe you can email them to me um, before our next meeting, so I can run them by Dr. Dolan and the committee policy committee, so we can have clean copies for first reading um, next meeting. Uh, I do have to. We do have to approve, however, for final reading the following policies, which are. 6422 budget transfers, 6424 emergency contracts, and 9130 public complaints and grievances. Second. Questions or comments? Comment. Rich Matasic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Excuse me, Rich, for completeness. Um, I'd really love to have a vote on tabling the second oh, item. Okay. I would. I move to table item number two in policies, and I will bring forth those for first reading at our next board meeting. And I'll second. Rich, Rich Matesic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. <laughs> Mitch Slater? Okay. <laughs> yes. Just I think about it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Curriculum, instruction, and programs. Anne. Yes, thank you. I would ask the board to approve the 2012-2013 nursing plan. I have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Jeannie. You're welcome. Um, this is a plan that we approve every year. Um, just does anyone have any questions on it? Seeing no questions, we can vote. Mitch Matesic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstead? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Oleg? Yes. Mitch Slater? Yes. Okay. And I would ask the board to approve for first reading the following curricula under World Language, Italian 1, 2, and 4. May I have a second? Second. Jane, thank you. <laughs> um, curriculum met last week and we reviewed the revisions for these Italian courses and um, I I'm just happy to report how many kids take Italian. 
We have 227 students in the Italian program, and I just, I thought that was a lot, and I think that's great. I wanted to share that. Um, we have three sections of Italian 1, three sections of Italian 2, two sections of Italian 3, one section of Italian 3 honors, and one combined section of Italian 4 and 4 honors. So they continue to take Italian um, through senior year, which also I think is great. And basically these are just revisions. Each course was updated to align with the New Jersey Core Curriculum Content Standards and the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. Does anyone have any questions on that? Okay. You can vote on that too then. Bridge Potesic? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstev? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Mitch Slater. Yes. Anything else? No. That's it. Mm -hmm. Moving to finance and noting we've already approved resolution number one. I ask the board to consider resolutions two through 19. A second? A second. Thank you. I would note uh, item 19, a monetary gift from Brad and Carrie Phillips to Franklin Elementary School for the purchase of iPads for the resource rooms for oh. teachers and classrooms with any leftover funds to be used to purchase books for the resource rooms. We thank you very much for that donation. Um, I would also uh, just ask uh, Dana on item, where did we go? On the uh, five-year, on the facility plan uh, recommendation, mm -hmm. can you just distinguish that from the five-year plan? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that to me was more ongoing maintenance and the things that might be in Mike's budget every year. Right. Distinct the, from what we keep talking about as boilers and bathrooms and everything else. Right, that that's accurate? correct. That's a, the comprehensive maintenance plan is what is in here and it's actually, it shows three years, so it shows prior year, the current year, and next year's projection. Um, and that also is, is going along with the M1, which is the required maintenance form. So there's a minimum amount that you must budget in your operating budget for maintenance, which is what's on that M1 form. Um, and then you can budget more than that, um, which we typically do and probably will continue to do. Um, and these are, these are just estimates and plans um, for now. Obviously, when you get to budget time, um, these numbers may change for 13, 14. Okay, thank you. And then separately, uh, there were a few resolutions that dealt with uh, what I'll call cleanup of prior minutes or uh, secretary reports or fund balances which look like kind of from the beginning of your tenure a few months back is, is just making adjustments to get the balances to where they should be. Is there any overriding comment there? Or? No, the, the adjustments were mainly to June, um, but because we made adjustments that, that changed our final numbers for June, um, that also would change our beginning numbers in July. Um, for so every that's month, why, right. right. And that's why we have July and August that are now um, coming to you for re resubmission. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hi, oh, Jay, I'm sorry, Jay. Thank you. Uh, back to the school facilities M1 report. The um, the minimum annual target expenditure. Is there a formula for that based on the uh, yes the building replacement value? Yep. All right. Um, and. Um, I couldn't, I had a hard time making heads or tails of the um, comprehensive plan. It seems like the verbiage is fairly, I'll use the word mm -hmm. boilerplate, even though boiler is part of it. <laughs> um, it is. What am I to take away from it? It, it, it Just is. Just a value it, yes, statement? Yes, it, it is boilerplate, so to say. I mean, it's, it, we've, it's obviously we've added kind of a lot of, yeah, exactly. We've put in there a lot of things that, uh, you know, a lot of what we budget for in maintenance is not necessarily stuff that uh, we can predict ahead of time, especially this far in advance. Um, it, it also tends to be recurring <laughs> um, because of right. the type of maintenance that we have to do. So it does look like the same information that we keep putting there, um, but that actually is what our maintenance costs actually reflect from year to year. Okay, so do we have to file this with the state also? Yes. Okay. So we have to tell them something and we give them a, a broader picture of where we're going to spend our money for the usual suspects. Correct. Yeah. And your long range facilities plan is where you have your big project. Right. Okay. Um, 
Yeah. Number two, Rich. Yes. Accept race to the top phase three grant in the amount of thirteen thousand ninety six dollars. So what are our objectives here? Dr. Dolan, what are we gonna do with the money? So did you say race to the top? Yeah. I was shutting I off the did. projector. I apologize. I did. Ra sure, we race talked to the to top. We, we had talked about this um, when the application was submitted in the spring, is my memory. Yeah. Um, so that money actually is being used to help support our um, literacy initiative at the elementary levels. Okay, great. And um, number three, we are... Uh, this, this really isn't a, a cost, but we're adding someone to our physical therapy uh, professional services consulting That's correct. group. Uh, so I did have a question, um, and this might be to Dr. Weissman. Do our student requirements exceed our current full-time staff availability? Or is this just um, noting that there is an individual who... Um, whose services is warranted sometimes, and so we're just kind of putting them on our list. Oh, it's, uh, you want me to go? I do. <laughs> in other words, is there a trend here, or is this just uh, kind yeah. of putting somebody in the Rolodex? No, yes. From time to time, we need additional providers, so we, so we add them to our list. Okay. Um, we actually had one provider retire last year, so we, we like to have a, a nice number of a provider so that we can go to somebody in the event that we have overflow or in a special case or if somebody specializes in a particular area. So okay. that's, that's Thanks. Nice. You're welcome. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Comments, questions? All right. Rich Matasek? Yes. Ann Carey? Yes. Jane Clancy? Yes. Mark Friedman? Yes. Roseanne Kerstad? Yes. Ginny Lights? Yes. Gretchen Olick? Yes. Mitchell Slater? Yes. I'd ask the board to note the notes for the record, and that will take us into legislation. No report. Thank you. Any unfinished business of the board? Any new business? Ad hoc committee reports. Just very briefly, that uh, I'll tie it into the liaison. I met. I was at the high school PTSO. I mentioned earlier, and uh, obviously technology was a big part of the discussion. And things are going very well. And I just one or two things I thought I would point out is that uh, they've been bringing Apple um, to do some training sessions, and they actually have a had a Genius Bar Day um, with all the teachers, um, and they're you know taking breaking it down. As far as the iPads with, you know, those that are novices, those that have worked with them before, and having separate training programs going on. I think most of that's going on this week, um, and it's just been just really very successful. And I think the thing that impressed me the most um, in listening to Peter talk was the sharing that's going on between all of the different teachers, all of the different grades, and the excitement um, from some of the... Uh, more seasoned teachers learning from some of the younger teachers um, about things that they're putting together, especially some of the apps that they're working with. And, and uh, so I really love how it's all gelling. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a big part of uh, um, the meeting itself, but I figured I'd throw it in under, the, under ad hoc. Good. Thank you. Anyone else? Where are we? Uh, we are now into liaison reports. Anyone there? Jenny. I'll let you do PTC. Would you like to do PTC, General? You're so good at it. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, then I'll, I'll second. Anyway. All right. So I'll start with the PTC presidency. I don't think we've met since we met on the third, right? Second, yeah. On the second? Okay. Well, that was the fourth. <laughs> um, uh, PTO presidents a meeting. Uh, had a fascinating... Um, Conversation was this the time? Yes, my food days presentation. A, um, a, a, a married couple talked about their um, uh, credit card uh, processing software that allows schools to manage um, fundraising activity. Um, 
and organizes uh, funds that uh, purchases, parent purchases, like pizza day, like um, uh, apparel, school apparel, sales, like uh, fun, any uh, wrapping paper. paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sally Foster. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe this is used by Tamaquas School, and they brought the um, individuals in to have a conversation at the table, and I believe that um, there was considerable interest around the table for using this um, concept. There's a built-in percentage of cost for the uh, use of the, uh, the credit card processing as in the back-end operation, but it is not shown as an add-on when in, during checkout. It's, um, people have the opportunity to build it into the cost itself. So. Um, is it up on the website? I think I saw it. Might, it might. Well, it's used by Tamakwas now. So just Tamakwas? Uh, there I, may have I, been I others who have started it. I on one of the other schools. Edison, I think. Well, they may have been. They were interested in it, right? They may have been kind of generating interest or saying, go go and look at it, or, yeah. you know, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I know it's for quite a while we've been um, thinking about looking at, kind of contemplating how can we make um, life digitally, electronically easier for uh, bill payment, especially for, um, and also for organizing volunteer activities supporting these uh, various uh, situations. Apparently, this is a very easy way for the distribution of lists of parent groups that work at Pizza Day, what, you know, which kids get what pizza, <laughs> which drinks, what, so forth. Um, so it, it, this um, presentation met with really strong um, support and enthusiasm. There will be some, so look, um, you know, there may be some changes around to all schools over time. Um, and um, let's see, ah, PT, uh, the McKinley School PTO meeting had a wonderful discussion uh, driven by new principal <coughs> Mark Buono and a teacher, uh, I think he's fifth grade teacher, uh, Brendan Hickey. Fourth grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, fifth grade now? Uh, fourth, fourth. fourth grade, fourth grade regarding um, the uh, reading workshop and uh, writing workshop. Terrific discussion about balanced literacy, about what happens in the classrooms, about uh, building the classroom library uh, for leveled books. <laughs> about, um, I asked a question about whether that meant that school libraries would be leveling books, and I got the answer that no, in fact, um, school libraries were going to be the focus for children's entertainment reading, uh, but that librarians would define mentor books, which are those books that are used for the instruction of specific level concepts that children are um, moving through their, their reading development. I was. Um, I was really engaged, and, and it was a, a great discussion about um, the concept. I was also really touched to hear that um, instead of using the money allocated to McKinley for an iPad cart, as a school community, the staff had chosen instead to take the funds and distribute it to the teachers for the purchase of additional uh, classroom literacy books. That was PTO money, right? It wasn't as though they took district money. I just want to make that clear. Okay. Yeah, they took PTO but, but money was, and made that decision. Yeah, it was the choice, the, their choice to to forego <laughs> the um, the iPad card right. and to to use it to benefit every child and every teacher within their classroom. So I thought that that was a really good outcome. And then Gretchen and I, along with um, Dana Sullivan and. Mr. Pinero, um, who gave wonderful presentations at the uh, Westfield Parent Teacher Council General Meeting. Thank you very much for, for attending. Um, recently, uh, the assistant superintendents have done a great job in uh, informing these parents of uh, what's going on in their different departments, and I think it's been a, a terrific idea to have them there. Um, there was uh, Some, uh, one question of, of, that I thought was reasonable to bring up here, just kind of a question of special ed uh, and inclusion uh, training 
and what training is being given, specific training is being given to um, general ed teachers about inclusion and interactions of inclusion, especially with our new um, language arts curriculum and the special ed teachers themselves in the, in the language arts curriculum. So I thought that that was a reasonable thing for us to kind of um, drill into a, as we go forward. And something actually that we've spent a great deal of time talking about. Um, the special education program is distinct from regular education program, right. and yet you need to have everybody understanding the same philosophy that we're, we're using, and patterns, that, not patterns, strategies we're using. So we have the same instruction for teachers, and we also have separate right. to address those two things. Um, Further regarding balanced literacy, um, one of the schools said that they needed parent education or an academy of sorts. Um, I understand that a number of the schools had initiated that at back to school night or had separate parent meetings um, early on this um, last couple of months or last six weeks. And one of the schools said that they would benefit from it. So it, it was a, a really strong sharing moment to figure out that all they had to do was go ask their principal <laughs> to really focus in on um, a little more communication. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the bond, the potential for what we passed tonight with a bond referendum. Definition of funds required for our roofs in December and a point was made that it was really, really important for the community to know what are we at risk of losing we need a real, a clear plan for what we'll lose um, so that we can make decisions about um, and, and understand the, uh, the downside of not passing the bond. That's it. I'll just tag on to that. One of the issues that came up at that meeting no. was um, it, it, the possibility of publishing the agenda for yes. our board meetings yes. earlier. Right. Um, I don't know if that's possible or not, but there were comments that and Paul made that great presentation and, 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 and said he was going to provide more detailed information at tonight's meeting, and people were commenting that if they had had more advance notice, maybe they could have done it. So I just throw it out there as something that we should consider, yeah. if possible, you know, putting the agenda out sooner rather than later. Or, or at least uh, superintendent mm. report topics. Mm -hmm. If we know six weeks, four weeks in advance, not the whole agenda, but just the topical identity of something that's coming up. We could put it on the website. We could uh, alert people to stay tuned because there are certainly, um, whether or not they arrive here, they would know then to you know, DVD the, the meeting and look for a, a, the video online. Right. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that's on your blog. All right. Anyone else? I attended the Roosevelt PTSO meeting, um, and they discussed their plans for the year. Mr. Carey came in and talked about the scores, the New Jersey S scores specific to Roosevelt, and um, said he would come back to talk even more because he was running off to do a teacher observation. All right. Anyone else? With that, I'd again recognize the public for questions and or comments on any topic. Seeing no one come to the podium, I'd ask the board to approve the following resolution. Resolved that the Board of Education move into private session for the purpose of discussing matters rendered confidential by state and federal <coughs> law, personnel, pending or anticipated litigation, and pending or anticipated contract negotiations and be it further resolved that any discussion held by the board which need not remain confidential and the results of the discussion will be made public as soon as practicable. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstained? Motion carries. We are adjourned.